This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God by the believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jockler 66 Hour of the Truth on the channel of War on Disinformation. This is the next reading of the wonderful book The History of the Inquisition written by Philip van Limborch in 1692 and then translated into English in 1731. This is the 34th reading which will be called Several Councils Held and the Laws of the Emperor Frederick II, by which the office of the Inquisition was greatly promoted. And this deals, of course, with Chapter 12. As you can see here, Chapter 11 was Part 33. This is now Chapter 12. Um, you don't know that, of course, because I upload these randomly, these videos, but uh, it has been almost two months since my last reading because today is uh, the 1st of November 2017 and I have done so many videos in the meantime, especially also in German. Read the whole book of Martin Luther against the papacy, which I'm now reading for the moment in English on my main channel. And I didn't plan that book, so that came in between all my plans I had made already. <laughs> and that is why I didn't pursue this history of the Inquisition book from Philip van Limborch, the way that I actually planned it on beforehand when I really wanted, when I started this, and really wanted to go fast through it, but um, this book also is uh, here and there a little bit difficult to understand, at least in my opinion, and I hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me when here and there I make mistakes, like I did with the Albigenses and the Waldenses, especially with the Albigenses, when I thought that they were completely apostate and after, afterward it seemed that that was just because of the accusations of the Roman Catholic Church and they were false. So, of course, the Albigenses are quite a Bible-believing people, have always been, the Waldenses anyway, Sabbath-keeping people and, uh, you know, about keeping the Sabbath, 
Still after years I get so many comments always from the same people. And um, in the meantime I have to say that I, I still don't care anymore for all these comments. I, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. So to me, keeping the Sabbath is not a salvation issue. Seventh-day Adventists make it a salvation issue. I don't do. But the Sabbath was ordained at creation week. Before there was any Jew, before there was any Israelite, there were only two people on earth. At the moment, for sure we know of one, Adam, that was there when God created the Sabbath, right? Then we, we could go to Genesis and see if the woman also was made on the on the sixth day. But that's that's only of minor importance. The point is there were not more than two people on the earth when the Sabbath was ordained by the Lord. And the Sabbath was made for man as a day of rest. And when you say I worship every day and to me every day a Sabbath fine with me, I'm not judging. You have to stay you have to stand before God. Like I have to stand before God. And I think it's alright to work six days and rest the seventh and for May that for me that seventh day is the Sabbath <clears throat> the Saturday, the seventh day of the week as it was biblically and as I adhere to the Bible, that's the way I do it. And there is no way the law is taken away because I, I, I don't even want to start this discussion but just in a very little introduction here I tell you very very shortly if the, le if the law is done away with if all the Ten Commandments are done away with we are living in a lawless world, then there is no transgression, because where there is no law, there is no transgression. Where there is no transgression, there is no sin, where there is no sin, there is no need for a Savior, and that means that Jesus Christ would have died in vain. The point when we think that the law has not the same impact anymore as it had before, it's just that the law can only condemn us, but grace can make us free. The grace of God. That's what saves us. Not keeping the law. Nobody can keep the law perfect. There was only one man in the whole history of the earth who kept the law perfectly, and that was Jesus Christ. That's why he could take all our sins on him and shed his blood for us. So... I keep the law as an expression of my respect, of my love to my God, because he made these laws, and he knows that I can't fulfill them, so I try to fulfill them as good as I can to show him how much I love him. That kind of respect is the reason why people should keep the law, the Ten Commandments. And it's still Ten Commandments. There is not one commandment ever taken out of. And if you say the Ten Commandments are done away with, then I say, fine, I'm horny, give me your wife for tonight so I can fornicate with her. Because, hey, you know, adultery doesn't exist anymore. And if I don't like you, I can even kill you, because, you know, you shall not kill, you shall not commit murder. That's no law anymore. And when I have need, I can go to my neighbor and steal all the money that I want to. Because there is no law against it anymore. The law is done away with. Do you see how ridiculous that is? Because when you abolish one commandment, you abolish them all. And then you are living exactly in the world that Satan wants to create. Or as Alistair Crowley said it once, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Mean, make up your law yourself, because there is no law. Do as thou wilt, and that's the law. I don't live after that prerogative, and I hope you don't. But now that's enough for this little introduction. After two months I want to get back into this. And yeah, by the way, you saw that the, 
starting melody of uh, the hour of the truth song the inquisition song is not in this video um, this is because due to my computer um, I, I just uh, take the original recorded what I'm recording right now live with my hypercam with my desktop camera uh, I'm gonna take this recording and I don't work it through um, Windows Movie Maker so that also means that I don't add titles or anything this is just the desktop recorded video as it is recorded this is the way you see it because I hope that the solution so is a little bit better that you can read along in the book that we are going to pick up right now in um, where is it here? Page 71 in the PDF or 239 in the PDF and 71 it is in the book. As you can see here, highlighted chapter 12. Yeah, next reading number 34 and I made this note on the 6th of September 2017 and we are today the 1st of November, so almost two months later. Now, without any further ado, let's go to the read. Several councils held, and the laws of the Emperor Frederick II, by which the office of the Inquisition was greatly promoted. And let's not forget, when we are speaking here about heretics, we are always speaking about heretics in the sense of the Roman Catholic Church's understanding. And the Roman Catholic Church calls everyone a heretic who does not adhere to the Roman Catholic canon law, who does not adhere to the ultramontane power, to the hundred percent, to the to the uh, to the almighty power of the Pope, as they call it, to the and does not adhere to um, Roman Catholic canon law, and who does not adhere to the morals and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. That's how heretics are determined by them. The Bible says he is a heretic who does not believe the word of God. Okay? So the heretics that are addressed here is everybody who does not adhere to the Roman Catholic Church. When you are a Bible believer, and by that of course you don't give in to the power of the Pope, then you are a heretic. Only that we can make that sure that everybody understands that before I'm going to start reading right now. Because there are always some new listeners here and there. I hope. So, let's start. The Earl of Toulouse, being thus subdued, severer laws were enacted against heretics. Raymond himself made many laws against them, ordered all the heretics in his country to be apprehended, and that the inhabitants of every city or castle should pay one mark for every heretic to the person who took him. Mark is the currency they had in Europe at that time. Louis also, the French king, put forth a constitution against heretics in which he commands the immediate punishment of all who should be adjudged heretics by the bishop or any other ecclesiastical person. He deprives all their favorers of the benefit of the laws, commands their guards to be conf uh, their goods. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he deprives all their favorers of the benefit of the laws commands their goods to be confiscated and never to be restored to them or their posterity, and that the bailiff should pay two marks of silver to any to anyone that apprehended an heretic. And now the Pope labored with all his might to, con uh, to confer a greater power to the on the inquisitors and to establish for them a tribunal in which they might sit and pronounce sentence of heresy and heretics as judges delegated from himself and representing his person. Now this is a very important sentence. The Pope labored with all his might to, cons to confer a greater power on the inquisitors and to establish for them a tribunal in which they might sit and pronounce sentence of heresy and heretics as judges delegated from himself and representing his person. Meaning that when you had this tribunal of the inquisition, 
that in the time went from village to village seeking out heretics, whether because they were declared heretics by other people in that village or somebody doesn't like his neighbor and said he is a heretic and in that way he was accused of it. You have to understand that the people who were on the inquisitorial, uh, let's say between uh, quotation marks, court, yeah, that they were presenting or that they were representing the Pope with all his power. So what they said was quote-unquote infallible. What they said, there was no, um, how, how, how do you say that, um, uh, there was no appeal against. Uh, you couldn't appeal against their laws. This is what the Pope says here. The Pope labored with all his might that they, as judges delegated from himself, and representing his means the Pope's person. Very, very important. Because this gives the courts or the tribunal of the Inquisition an incredible power. But to this there were in the beginning great obstacles. The people not easily, not easily admitting that new tribunal rightly judging that great numbers would be destroyed by the informations of the inquisitors so that they were very ill looked on by all, even before they had obtained the power of judging. For the magistrates and wiser part of the people foresaw what must happen upon their being invest invested with such an authority, and were far from thinking it safe that their fortunes and lives and those of their fellow citizens should be exposed to the pleasure of the Pope's emissaries and that they should be made entirely obnoxious to their tyranny. But upon the conquest of the Albigenses, and the taking their countries and cities, the Pope caused the Inquisition to proceed with even greater success. For in France, as Pegna observes in John Calderon's treatise about the form of proceeding against heretics, there were held several councils at diverse times and places, of the French archbishops about the methods of proceeding against and punishing heretics. In the year of our Lord 1229 there was a council at Toulouse where many statutes were made which were published there by, Romus, uh, by Romanus, Cardinal Deacon of St. Angelus, Legate of the Apostolic See. In the year 1235, another council was held near Narbonne of the French prelates in which this affair was more fully discussed than at Toulouse. Afterwards, in 1246, there was another provincial council at B. When these things were particularly settled, then uh, where these things were more particularly settled than in the two former councils. The acts of these councils were not discovered for a long while, but found some time since the Vatican Library, in the li Vatican Library and in an old uh, manuscripts parchment, which was brought to Rome from the Inquisition at Florence. Pegna adds that he would soon publish these councils with his comments on them, and says that they are very useful and suited to the office of the inquisitors of heretical brevity. But I could never yet learn whether they have seen the light. So our author here is not, has not seen the publications of these councils of 1229 and 1235 that we are speaking about here. And those councils at Narbonne and Toulouse were held in the south of France. Yeah? Narbonne and Toulouse are cities in the south of France. And that was the region where the Albigenses and also the Waldenses lived in that time. So our author here can never learn or never learned whether these publications have ever seen the light. Well, 
if he cannot tell that they probably didn't and are probably still in the Vatican archives somewhere hidden but Jesus Christ our Lord will bring everything to light when he comes back these were the transactions in France in Rome about the year 1230 Raymond of Pegnaforte who was a Dominican compiled by the command of Pope Gregory the Ninth the books of the Creedals into which, the collect, into which he collected all the laws of the councils and popes against heretics. Afterwards, Antichrist Pope Boniface VIII ordered a sixth book of the Decretals to be wrote. After this were added the Clementines and the Extravagantes, made on various occasions that the Inquisitors might want nothing for the full exercise of their office. And as the Waldenses had stolen uh, into Aragon and Navarre, chiefly from the neighboring uh, Languedoc region, there was a synod held at Tarracona uh, about the year 1240, in which there were many things enacted concerning heretics and their punishments. Even the Emperor Frederick II himself put forth many laws against heretics, their accomplices and favourers at Padua, by which he greatly promoted the Inquisition. And the first, which begins Commissi Nobis, he ordains that those heretics who were committed by the Church to the secular court should be put to death without mercy, that converts through fear of death should be imprisoned that heretics with their abetter, uh, with their abettors where they wherever they were found sorry that heretics with their abettors wherever they were found should be kept in custody till they were punished according to the sentence of the church that persons convicted of heresy or convicted of heresy who had fled to other places should be taken up that such as were relapsed should be punished with death, that heretics and their favourers should be deprived of the benefit of appeal, that their posterity to the second generations should be incapable of all benefices and offices, but what their heirs should be indemnified sorry, but that their heirs should be indemnified if they discovered their parents' wickedness. And lastly, he takes under his imperial and special protection the predicant friars deputed for the faith of the uh, against the heretics in all the parts of the empire and all others who were sent for and should come for the judgment of heretics commanding the magistrates severely to punish all convict heretics after condemnation by the ecclesiastical sentence. In this second edict, which begins in consulitem tunicam, after expressing great abhorrence of the crime of heresy, he commands all impenitent heretics to be burned with fire and the favourers of the paterenes to be banished. In this third, beginning paterenorum receptatoris, he deprives the children of heretics of their honours unless any of them should discover one of the sect of the Paterines, and puts heretics themselves under the ban, confiscating their estates. In his fourth, beginning Cataros, he condemns all suspected persons as heretics, if they do not purge themselves within a year, commands his officials to exterminate heretics from all places subject to them, orders that the lands of the barons shall be seized with, uh, by the Catholics if they do not purge them from heretics within a year after proper admonition and ordains many punishments against the favourers of heretics and the most severe ones against all who apostatize from the face. But as the office of the Inquisition was very much promoted by these laws, it is worthwhile to give them entire. The first is this. Frederick, by the grace of God, Emperor of the Romans and always August, King of Jerusalem and Sicily, to his beloved princes, the venerable archbishops, bishops and other prelates of the church, to the dukes, marquises, 
earls, barons, governors, skeletons, birth graves, advocates, judges, ministers, officials, and all other his faithful sub subjects throughout the whole empire to whom these letters shall come, greeting and all happiness. I don't think we are going to read above a lot of happiness in this letter, but let's see. The care of the imperial government committed to us from heaven and over which we preside by the gift of God and the height of our dignity demand the material sword which is given to us separately from the priesthood against the enemies of the faith and for the extirpation of heretical brevity that we should pursue with judgment and justice those vipers and persidious children who insult the Lord and his church, and though they would tear out be and though they would tear out the very bowels of their mother, we shall not suffer the wretches to live to infect the world by their seducing doctrines. Now excuse me, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger because then it is a little bit easier for me to read. So, let's get over here and uh, try this. We shall not suffer these wretches to live who infect the world by their seducing doctrines and being themselves corrupted more grievously taint the flock of the faithful. We therefore appoint and ordain that heretics of whatsoever name throughout our empire being condemned by the church and delivered over to the secular power shall be punished according to their deserts. Now, do you understand that here you have a complete working together of state and church? And this is very important, you know. The church declares someone is a heretic and then gives the power to the state, the secular power, to punish these people if they don't do it themselves. This is church and state union and this is so dangerous. That's why church and state should always be separate. And there is almost no country, at least I know not of anyone in this world today, where church and state are really effectively separated. When you think of the United States of America, you say, well, we have separation of ch church and state. Yes, on paper, but in practice? For example, what is the 501c3? It is a tax-exempt status, but taxes have to do with the state. And churches are tax-exempt, so that is a combination of church and state, because there the state says, okay, you don't have to pay any taxes. On the other hand, you also cannot make policy against us. Because if you teach or preach against the state, well, let's see what happens then in the United States of America. On paper, you have a separation. In truth... In real life, I think you don't. And this is here the same case. The church defines someone a heretic and the state takes over and punishes according to the Roman Catholic canon law. Because the state does not have any heretic laws. Because the state does not know any heretics. But the church does. And the church not only gives the state the power, but even requires the state to execute their judgment. And that is what you get when church and state are one. That is why the fourth beast is different from all the others. That is why the Roman, the papal Roman Empire is so different from all the others because church and state are combined and the Pope even calls himself the Caesar. 
So he is the spiritual leader of the world, as he claims, and he is the temporal leader of the world. What is that but a melting together of church and state? And this is what we read here about already. We therefore appoint and ordain that heretics of whatsoever name throughout our empire, or today the whole world, just if we translate this sentence here into 2017, being condemned by the church and delivered over to the secular power, shall be punished according to their deserts. So the church gives the quote-unquote culprits to the state and the state executes the judgment. If any of them, after their being apprehended, shall, re uh, shall return to the unity of the faith through the fear of death, let them suffer perpetual imprisonment and do penance according to the canons. So what does that mean? That that means to me, as far as I understand it, let's highlight this so that we can read the sentence a little bit better. If any of them, so of the heretics, after being apprehended, shall return to the unity of faith through the fear of death. So I'm a heretic, but now the police apprehends me. And all of a sudden, because I fear for my life, I say, okay, I will now proclaim to believe the Roman Catholic doctrine to adhere to the Roman Catholic Church, then it says, let them suffer perpetual imprisonment and do penance according to the canons. Now, what is penance according to the canons is something that we probably learn when we go a little bit deeper into the book. But it says also, and that is something that we understand right now, let them suffer perpetual imprisonment. What does that mean? That does mean that you never get your life back, that you never get your freedom back, but that you will stay in prison. Perpetual imprisonment is sentence for life. So it doesn't matter if you, quote-unquote, convert to the Roman Catholic Church. And that is the prerogative that we know already from the Roman Catholic Church, that is, convert or die. Huh? So... Just want to make this point sure that when you say, oh, now they got me, now I'm afraid of death, now I convert to Roman Catholicism, still you are to suffer perpetual imprisonment and do penance according to the canons. Father, whatsoever heretics shall be found in the cities, towns or other places of the empire by the inquisitors appointed by the apostolic see or other orthodox persons zealous for the faith, let those who have jurisdiction there seize their persons at the instance of the inquisitors and other Catholics and keep them in strict custody till being condemned by the censure of the church, they perish by an accursed death for their denying the sacraments of faith and life. Yeah? Without the seven sacraments of the Holy Roman Church, there is no salvation, is what Roman Catholic law teaches. And that's why when you are denying the sacraments, quote-unquote, of faith and life, then you are a heretic. We condemn also to the same punishment all whom the craft of the deceitful enemy shall employ as advocates, unlawfully to defend the error of these heretics, especially since those who are defiled with such wickedness are equal in guilt, unless they, uh, unless they des de desist upon proper admonition and wisely consult the preservation of their lives. We subject also to the same just punishment. <laughs> Sorry, but he calls this just punishment. Just in the eyes of the Lord, the Creator God, or just in the eyes of the Antichrist? We subject also to the same just punishment those who, being convicted, of heresy in any one place, fly to, get, fly to another, meaning not fly with a plane, but fly from flee, 
that they may more safely pour out the poison of their heretical pravity, unless in this instance they have a testimony in their favor from those who have been converted to the face from the same error, or from those who have convinced them of the heresy, which is in this case we allow may, uh, we allow may lawfully be done. We condemn also to death all such heretics who, being brought to trial, shall abjure their heresy when in extreme danger of life, if afterwards convicted of having dissembled and taken a false oath, and of having willingly relapsed into the same error, that thereby their vile dissimulation may be more destructive to themselves, and their falsehood meet with its deserved punishment. Now I can't but make a little comment here, because here this Frederick speaks of we condemn uh, who are being brought to trial abjure the heresy when in extreme danger of life afterwards convicted having taken their oath or having willingly uh, relapsed into the same error uh, that hereby the vile where was this now with this with this oath I'm looking for that um, being taught to try shall abjure the heresy when in extreme danger of life, if afterwards convicted of having dissembled and taken a false oath. Here, I was looking for this one. Yeah? So, I was looking for this one here. Let's uh, just highlight this as I see I have to go here. Uh, taking a false oath. This, this is the one that I wanted to go into. Um, we condemn oaths to death. He says, if afterwards convicted of having dissembled and taken a false oath. Now, what is a false oath? Purgatory, right? Um, uh, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, the purgatory, that's, that's something else. Perjury. Perjury is a, uh, is a false oath, right? But the Roman Catholic Church always had their quote-unquote mental reservation. You remember that, of course, from the time of the um, of the oaths of the Jesuits, uh, of the extreme oaths of the Jesuits, that they say that if the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells them that white is black and black is white, meaning truth is lie and lie is truth, whenever the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells them, they will act like that, and they can take any oath they want because they have mental reservation. Now, when you have mental reservation, that is taking a false oath. So, in the Roman Catholic Church, they do that historically all the time, but then, of course, they convict others when they judge that they have taken a false oath. Like, I swear to believe in one holy Roman Catholic Church, and they, of course, say that only to save their lives. So the Roman Catholic Church, of course, that does not accept mental reservation from heretics, but accepts only mental reservation within their own ranks. A point that we have to make clear here, and hopefully understand this well. Now we farther deprive heretics, their receivers and favorers, of all benefit of proclamation and appeal, being willing that every seed of this heretical stain should, by all means, be extirpated out of our empire, in which the true faith ought ever to be preserved. Yeah. What they call the true faith that ever to be preserved in the empire, I call the faith of the synagogue of Satan. Moreover, as we, have, as we have received greater favors from the divine mercy and are exalted to a higher dignity than the children of men, we ought to pay the more solemn services of, <coughs> services of gratitude. Sorry. If then we manifest our displeasure against those who, con who condemn us and condemn 
traitors in their persons and by stripping their children of their inheritance, how justly shall we be more incensed against those who blaspheme the name of God and revile the Catholic faith and deprive by our imperial authority all heretics, their receivers, abettors and advocates, and their heirs and poster posterity, even to the second generation of their temporal estates, public offices and honors, that they may continually mourn at the remembrance of their father's crimes. And now let's see, we go to the next page. And certainly know that God is a jealous God, punishing the iniquities of the fathers upon their children. Now here, <laughs> here he absolutely blasphemes, taking the word of God in a totally different context and turning it around to make it sound biblically, whereas he speaks with the voice of the devil. Huh? Uh, now let's let, let's go back. Um, I want to I wanna read this last sentence here again. We have to understand this very well, what he says here. Sorry. No. That they may continually mourn at the remembrance of their father's crimes and certainly know that God is a jealous God, punishing the iniquities of the fathers upon their children. This is taken right out of the second command uh, of the third commandment, uh, where you should no no out of the second commandment of uh, not making any images, uh, where he speaks of that God will punish the iniquities of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generations, of uh, and in the meantime show mercy to thousands of them that love him. So this is right taken out of the second commandment. To make it sound biblically, what they put over what this Frederick here puts into his quote unquote constitution. Huh? This is like we have today in, 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 in our modern world, you know, when they take the word of God and twist it and so that it so that it fits their agenda. Huh? That's what the Pope does, you know. You never hear the Pope reading from the Bible, but when he ever cites something out of the Bible, he does it only that it fits his agenda. Huh? And this is what they do here. Makes me sick when I read this. Not that we would exclude, here Frederick continues, from our mercy those who, keeping themselves free from the heresy of their fathers, shall discover their secret perditiousness. For whatever punishment their guilt may receive, we would not subject their innocent children to it. We hereby also declare our pleasure that we appoint the friars predicant of the order of predicants to take care of the faith against heretics in all parts of our empire. We also take under our special imperial protection all others whatsoever that shall come to judge heretics and grant them leave to go, f stay or return, except those who are under the ban of the empire, and will that none shall endure them, and that they shall have the assistance and recommendation of all the faithful in the empire. We farther command all and singular of you that wheresoever and to whomsoever of you shall uh, of of you they shall come, ye receive them kindly and keep their persons safe from all the attempts of heretics who may lay in wait for them and grant them your advice, safe conduct and assistance in the execution of affairs, so acceptable before God. And as to all heretics. They shall discover to you in their jurisdiction, let them be apprehended and kept in safe custody, till being ecclesiastically condemned, they shall suffer the deserved punishment, as knowing in that so doing their obedience will be pleasing to God and acceptable to us, meaning in assisting with their utmost endeavors 
the set friars to root out of all the parts of our empire this new unheard of and infamous heretical brevity. And if anyone shall be negligent and remiss in this matter, let him know that he shall be unprofitable before God and justly incur our highest displeasure. Dated at Padua, February 22nd. In the year that we read a page before, I don't remember now, 15, 4, uh, 1246 something, I guess, that was. And uh, when we are reading here, let him know that he shall be unprofitable before God. This Emperor Frederick, of course, speaks of the God of the Roman Catholic Church. That is Satan. That is not the God of the Bible. Unprofitable before God, he here speaks actually of the Pope. Of course, without these words, logically, but that's what he means. Now, after the first part comes the second, the second constitution of the Emperor Frederick, by the grace of God and the heretics and endeavouring to rend the seamless coat of our God, and ranging with deceitful words which declare their schismatical intention, strive to divide the unity of indivisible faith itself, and to separate the sheep from the care of Peter, to whom they were committed by the good shepherd to be fed. These are the ravenous wolves within, who put the meekness of the sheep, that they may be, that they may be better enter into the Lord's sheepfold. These are the worst angels. These are sons of naughtiness, of the father of wickedness, and the author of deceit, appointed to deceive simple souls. These are adders, who deceive the doves. These are serpents which crawl in privately and under the sweetness of honey vomit out poison, so that whilst they pretend to administer the food of life, they sting with their tail and mingle the most bitter poison into the cup of death. These sects are not now known by their ancient names, either that they may conceal themselves, or, what is yet more execrable, not content to be called by a name from amongst themselves, as the Arians were from Arius, and the Nestorians were from Nestorius. They call themselves Paterines, after the example of the martyrs who suffered martyrdom for the Catholic faith, as though they themselves were exposed to sufferings. These universal, uh, these, sorry, miserable, sorry, Sorry, I had to cut there. These miserable paterines, who do not believe the eternal trinity by their complicated wickedness, offend against three, meaning God, their neighbors, and themselves. Against God, because they do not acknowledge the son of the true faith. They deceive not their neighbors, whilst under... Oh, sorry. Under the pretense of spiritual food, they minister the delights of heretical brevity. But their cruelty to themselves is yet more savage, since, besides the loss of their immortal souls, and here you know already who is speaking, because immortal soul is a t teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, is a Babylonian teaching. There are no immortal souls in the Bible. When we die, we die. And our soul, our breath, goes back to God, who gives it in the first place. Huh? There are no immortal souls. So, whenever you read something like this, at least when this sentence comes up, you absolutely understand where this comes from. Since, beside the loss of their immortal souls, they expose their bodies to a cruel death, being prodigal of their lives and fearless of destruction, which by acknowledging the true faith they might escape, and which is horrible to express their saviors are not terrified by their example.
Against such enemies, God and man, we cannot contain our indignation, nor refuse to punish them with the sword of just vengeance, but shall pursue them with so much the greater vigor, as they appear to spread wider the crimes of their superstition to the more evident injury of the Christian faith and of the Church of Rome, which is adjured to be the head of all other churches in so much that they have propagated their falsehood from the borders of Italy and the parts of Lombardy, where they are certainly informed their wickedness doth more especially abound, even to our kingdom of Sicily. This being most highly offensive to us, we ordain in the first place that the crime of heresy and of every condemned sect, whatever the name of it be, shall be reckoned amongst the public crimes, as the ancient laws declare. Yea, let such know that they shall be deemed guilty of high treason itself. For as the crime of rebellion reaches to the loss of the life and goods of the persons condemned, and after they are dead makes the memory infamous, let the same be observed as to, be, uh, as to the aforesaid crime of which the Paterines uh, are guilty. And that the wickedness of those who walk in darkness, because they are not followers of God, may be discovered, we will, that if there, were, if there be none to accuse them, strict inquiry be made by our officials after such who commit these crimes, as well as after other mal malefactors, and that all who are informed against if there, if there be but the least suspicion be examined by the ecclesiastics and prelates. And if they shall find them to err in any one point of the Catholic faith, we, by this our present edict, condemn the Paterines and all other heretics of every kind and name to suffer death, committing them to the punishment of the flames, that they may be burned alive in public view, if after being pastorally admonished to forsake the dark snares of the devil, they will not acknowledge the God of light. Now are we displeased that, there, that herein we gratify them, since we are assured they can reap no other fruit of their error but punishment only. For such let no one dare to intercede with us. If any shall presume to it, let him know he shall justly incur our indignation. Dated at Padua, February 22nd, in the same year of the Lord. Interesting, of course, that he speaks here about the God of Light, right? The God of Light is, of course, for them another expression of the Lightbringer, of Lucifer. Yeah? And they call evil good and good evil. So when they say the dark snares of the devil, they mean, of course, the snares of God, because heretics are Bible believers. Don't forget what I mentioned in the beginning of this reading. You have to, when you really want to understand what is meant, you have to turn everything that this emperor says 180 degrees around to make a complete understanding of it. Now, first, second, this is now the third law. The third law is this. We condemn the receivers, accomplices and abettors of the Paterines to forfeiture of their goods and perpetual banishment, who by their care to save others from punishment have no fear or regard for themselves. Let not their children be in any wise admitted to honors, but always accounted infamous, nor let them be allowed as witnesses in any causes in which infamous persons are refused. But if the children of those who favor the Paterines shall discover any one of them, so that he shall be convicted, let them, as the reward of their acknowledgement of the face, be entirely restored by our imperial favor to the forfeited honor and estate. Now we go to the next page. Just giving it a second here. Now the fourth constitution of the Emperor Frederick. We condemn to perpetual infamy, withdraw our protection from and put under our ban the Puritans, Paterines, Speromists, Leonists, Arnaldists, Circumcised, Passagines, Josephines, 
Garatinus, Garatin, Garatensis, sorry, Albanensis, <coughs> Frankifici, Begardi, Comissi, Valdensis, Romanuli, Comanuli, Verini, Ortulini, those of the black water and all other heretics of both sexes and of whatever of whatsoever name. Now all these that I just read here we condemn to perpetual infamy, withdraw our protection from and put under our ban Puritans, Paterines, Spiromists, Leonists, Arnoldists and so on. There are a lot of names I have never ever heard of before and probably you didn't either, but those were all God-fearing, probably also Sabbath-keeping people. Now it says here in a footnote that certain heretics whose opinions are now almost equally unknown as the reason of, uh, of, of their names. And um, what does he mean with in, uh, intestabilis or intestflatus? That is another footnote. I, come, uh, I see that we, have, uh, that we come to it probably later. This is where the cross sign is made here. So we have to look at that later. Now continue. Huh? So, everything that I just counted up, all the names, all of the black water and all other heretics of both sexes and of whatever name, and ordain that their goods shall be confiscated in such manner that their children may never inherit them, since it is much more heinous to offend the eternal than the temporal majesty. But if any come under a bare suspicion, unless by a proper purgation, they shall demonstrate their innocence at the command of the church, according to the degree of their suspicion and the quality of their person. Let them be accounted infamous by all, and as under, and as under our ban. And if they remain such by the space of one year, we condemn them as heretics. We ordain also by this our perpetual edict that our officers and councils, our rectors, whatever be their officers, shall take a public oath for the defense of the faith, and that they will, bona fide, study to their utmost to exterminate from all the lands subject to their um, to, from all the lands subject to their jurisdiction, all heretics specified by the Church, so that whoever shall at any time henceforward be admitted into any office, either perpetual or temporary, he shall be obliged to confirm this edict by an oath. Otherwise, let them not be owned as our officers or consuls or anything like it. We pronounce all their sentences null and void. But if any temporal lord, having been cited and admonished by the, by the church, shall have neglected to purge his dominions from heretical pravity, after a year elapsed from the time of his admonition, let his country be seized by the Catholics and let them possess it without opposition, and preserve it in the purity of the faith by the extirpation of heretics." Solving, uh, saving the right of the principal lord, provided that he gives no impediment or obstruction. But let those who have no principal lord be subject to the same law. Furthermore, we put under our ban those who believe, receive, defend and favor heretics, ordaining that if any such person shall refuse to give satisfaction within a year after his excommunication, he shall be ipso jure infamous and not admitted to any kind of public offices or the like, nor to choose any persons to them, nor to be a witness. Powerful, eh? When you think about it. Now, before we go into the footnote, let's read here. Let him also be intestable. So we go into the footnote. Intestabilis of in, uh, interf, intestatus. Let him be as a condemned and infamous person, 
some of the councils had, ha, councils had decreed that every man should distribute a certain part of his goods, the tithe, for instance, to pious uses, for the redemption of his soul. And whosoever did not this was esteemed a wicked wretch that had no care for his salvation. On this account, the priests were condemned to exhort dying persons to wash away their sins by sacramental confession and to dispose of some parts of their effects in favor of the church or poor, for the salvation of their souls. This grew so into use that the absolution and viaticum were denied to such as did not obey the priest's orders in, his mat in this matter, as uh, profligate wretches, unmindful of their salvation, insomuch that they made no difference between a person who died without making any such deposition of, this, uh, of his effects, and one that flew himself, but accounted them both equally infamous. And therefore I think the meaning of the word intestabilis in this imperial constitution is that they shall be deprived of the liberty of making any such deposition of this of his effects to pious uses by will either to save his soul or prevent his being infamous so we continue let him also be intestable uh, which we just explained and let him not have the power of making a will we continue here on above, nor of receiving anything by succession of inheritance. Furthermore, let no one answer for him in any affair, but let him be obliged to answer others. If he should be a judge, let, this, let his sentence be of no effect, nor any causes he heard before him. If an advocate let him never be admitted to plead in anyone's defense. If a notary, let no instruments made by him be valid. Moreover, we add, that an heretic may be convicted by an heretic, and that the houses of the Paterines, the abettors and favorers, either whether, uh, either whether they have taught or where they have laid hands on others, on others shall be destroyed, never to be rebuilt. Dated at Padua, the February 22nd. Paulus Servita, which is a historian, tells us in his history of the Venetian Inquisition that these laws were made in the year of our Lord 1244. Yeah, I said 1246, so I was close. Eh? Bzovius and Reynold refer to them in the year 1225. But whatever was the year of their publication, it is certain that the Inquisition was greatly promoted by them, and that they were approved and confirmed by some of the Pope's bulls in which they were inserted. Now, before we come to a conclusion, because of course the reading is done, we have reached an hour, and we are going to continue next time in chapter 13. Let me just come to a little conclusion. Everything that we read here happened in the 13th century, right? This is the time where the Inquisition started. Of course, in the beginning, when we listened to the song that I don't play in the beginning of this video, but I played in the others, the Inquisition song, we know from 1205 to uh, from 1203 to 1805, 600 years. Here in the years, whether 1225 or 1244, the historians are not agreeing on the exact year, but in the uh, still in the first third of the 13th century, we read just now where the ground rules of the Inquisition were laid, and where it was put into an edict of the emperor of the Roman Empire to 
say what a heretic was and what was not a heretic and how to deal with them. And that when the church gave the secular power an heretic, the secular power had to carry out the sentences the heretics were convicted with by the church. Church and state together. So I leave you with this reading for today. And um, okay, I'm sorry I have no introductory song, but I want to see if um, when I upload this it is easier to read, and then I'm going to see next time how I'm going to continue with that. For today, I'm done with my reading, and um, thank you for watching, thank you for listening, thanks for your comments, and I hope to see you next time. Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Says God bless you. Signing off and bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away and go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross. Without our Savior, we're total lost.